How did you first get into computers? Um, oh, well, it was obviously very, very early. Uh, my first experience of a computer was at school, probably in 1976 or something like that. Right. And we had, you probably don't know an ASR33 teletype, but it's a 110 board, mechanical, right. um, little round keys with a lot of travel on them, and it prints in capitals only on a bog roll of paper that spools out the top. Uh, okay. And uh, I think as a class, and it was hooked via a modem to a computer in Hull, which was the nearest computer to Bridlington. And uh, I think we played uh, Lunar Lander, where you keep getting a print out of your height above the moon and your velocity and have to decide how much burn to do on your engines and things. Right. Um, I thought, obviously, this is great. This is, this is the way of the future, you can tell. Um, I was into electronics because I had an electronics kit, so I was reading the electronics mags, and they were at the point of saying, are we going to cover these fancy fangled microprocessors that are coming out, like the Intel 4004, you know, and things like that, or are we going to bifurcate into electronics mags and computer mags? Um, and I was fascinated by it all, and in 19... 78 I saved up enough money from waiting tables in Bridlington uh, to go down to London on the train and buy an Ohio Scientific Super Bowl 2 and bring it home in a backpack <laughs> uh, and uh, never looked back really. Hmm. So you went to university didn't you in Leeds so what did you plan to do there? Um, well I wanted to do uh, more to do with computing, so I did a degree in computer science there. Mm. Uh, in retrospect, it probably wasn't the best course for me because it was a bit high level. And despite me choosing all of the programming modules and all of the electronics modules and anything to do with the microprocessors, it all felt a little bit theoretical rather than hands on. Yeah. And whenever I raised that with the lecturers, they went, Oh, you should have done data processing course then. I'm like, No. <laughs> what, I really, what I really wanted was a course at York, but I didn't get the grades for it. Um, uh, so, but yeah, I mean, we learnt a lot at Leeds, um, but you know, that's where I met Graham and Andy, and we were all far more into microprocessors and low level stuff and electronics, and we were some of the more rarefied aspects of computer science. Um, uh, so we, we started real time in our final year, and some of us got degrees and some of us didn't bother, but I think we all had to look at where the campus was on an A to Z to go in and do our finals. It was, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, we definitely decided that we were going in a, a certain direction and that was uh, maybe this whole nascent area of computer games. Right. And how did all that start? Because it was 3D Tank Joe, wasn't it, your first one? Yeah, it was. Uh, I loved Battlezone in the arcades. Uh, it is a blatant rip-off of Battlezone with a few changes, um, but not many. And we just kicked off saying, can we actually do 3D graphics on a Z80 on this machine? Yeah. Um, and worked out how to draw lines and how to do maths. And we learned a lot doing Tank Duel, but I think yeah. about three quarters of the way through, we realized we were doing it all wrong um, and completely changed things for Star Strike. Um, but, you know, I've still got a very much a soft spot for Tank Duel. Um, what's interesting is, I wasn't a computer games programmer for very long. Uh, Tank Duel was 84. Mm. Uh, 
The final game I did was Abrams Battle Tank, a conversion from PC to Genesis, which I should have looked at when it was. 92, probably? Mm, uh, so, you know, less than a decade and bracketed by two driving around in a tank games, really. <laughs> <laughs> So how did that turn into a business? Because you uh, you wrote the game. How, how did you get? You know, how did it go from something on your computer into the shops? Um, uh, we we definitely realised part of the way through this was something we could sell. Um, yep. It would avoid this whole having to get a job thing. Um, <laughs> it kind of helped that Andy Onions, his father in Ludlow, was renting the offices to crash. Uh, so uh, you know, Newsfield. Um, uh, and they kind of, just by reading Crash and chatting to those guys, we got a few hints. Um, I mean, we got hints from other people. Like, you know, we wanted to do a load of stuff that interested us. So we were talking to some of the guys from Design Design saying, oh, we'd like to do this on this machine and this on this machine. And when, well, nothing sells on the Dragon and utilities don't sell anyway. So why are you doing that? But like, well, it sounds like fun. It's like, okay, if you want to, but you're not going to make much money. We're like, Let's park the fun for now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but when Tank Jewel came out, we were all still basically living in student halls of residence. We ended our finals. Um, and um, distributors wanting to order had to phone the one payphone in the whole block of flats and ask for you or Andy in flat F4 <laughs> to place an order with us. And uh, we'd take their order and we were getting the cassettes duplicated by a company in Barnsley and we were using fellow students as slave labour to fold the inlays and put them all in the cases and do the packaging and then secure a car and rock up and take the things. Um, I think we sold about 21,000 copies and we made three quid a copy. Wow. No, sorry, 7,000 copies, we made three quid a copy, so we made about 20, you know, 21 grand, yeah. which in 1984 pounds when your students get the two grand a year grand um it was a stupendously huge amount of money it really was ridiculous <laughs> um and i think by the time sales in tank jewels started tailing off we were in a back-to-back -back terrace in headingley uh and we went well we need to do another one you know what's the next atari game to rip off and obviously it was uh, uh star wars in the arcades so we were like well can we even do this on a spectrum it's like well given what we've learned Probably we think we've got the power.
you know, we've learned a few tricks and worked a few things out. And we're like, you know, if we'd done that from the start, but because of our development system, uh, we wrote Tank Jewel with one Spectrum and one cassette recorder. Right. <laughs> <laughs> if you can imagine how much effort that was. Oh, uh, definitely. Yeah. Uh, so there was no way to go back and recode all of this stuff. It was just too big a job. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, we did actually do a different version of Tank Jewel. I think went on some cover tapes where we'd fixed a few things to get rid of some of the video breakup, do some beam chasing and things like that. But for the most part, it was like, right, that's done on Mr. Star Strike. Right. And that one sold something like 55,000 copies and we made more like four quid a copy. Yeah. Um, which for you know, <laughs> three, three blokes living in a back-to-back -back terrace. <laughs> <laughs> it's you know so when did that evolve into getting actually offices and stuff like that um we were in actual offices in the city center um i think when we were starting star strike 2 yeah and that's when we're going well the way to scale this up is to employ people um but with one exception i don't think we did very good hires um we were just thinking if we get geeks our age uh, who like all of this stuff, they will be as smart as we are and as hard working as we are. And uh, that was not really the case. There was one guy who we actually employed as a YTS student. He was age 16. And YTS was one of these getting people into work things. We employed him. And um, uh, he's Steve Caslin, and he's gone on to run his own games companies, and he's still in gaming. I, I used to work with him actually at RuneCraft. Yeah. Yes. Well, Steve, Steve Caslin. Yeah. Bright guy. Yeah. Yeah. Bright guy. He started work for me age sixteen as a YTS student. Ah, small world. Wow. <laughs> small world. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but you know, I, I I kind of moved slightly sideways because the games programming tool company cross products was bought by sega but steve carried on you know doing gaming really yeah uh, so so goes into um, star strike 2 so obviously you had to step up you know change it make it more complicated than the the first game so yeah. what were your first ideas um we wanted it level based but we wanted it to be original rather than ripping off something from atari um we had this weird idea that somehow the spectrum could do polygons um and we did persuade you to do polygons but you have to be sparing with them you you have to design around the limitations of polygon filling on the machine um we did not really understand the difference between taking a proven game format and porting it aping it yeah and coming up with something original and I think we struggled with the gameplay on Star Strike 2. I think we got there in the end. I think some of the levels were strong. Um, but I don't think we really understood that difference between doing a port and doing something original. Um, um, and I'm pleased we did it. And it sold nearly as well as Star Strike, but not quite as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that was why you know when we were talking about skinning the cat a different way yeah uh, how to, we could hire people uh better and use our skills at doing some of the engines with other people doing the coding so we were talking to some other people about setting something up um but we were always a bit cautious of you know you know, suits you know people, people, <laughs> people who were well, I'll do the management, don't worry, you just do the programming. We were like, yeah, okay. Um, would it have worked? Maybe. But then we got um, the into discussions with Rainbird mm. about Star Glider. Yeah. And they also introduced us to, you know, people who were doing far better programming tools that really let us work an awful lot faster than the weird bodged together stuff we had. Yeah. Um, and um you know that that took off really um and we kind of i think star glider was about the last eight bit thing that we really did um 
other than some of the ports of carry and we were really into the which Andy Onions did on his own, a bit of a superhero, those eight-bit ports of Carrier. Um, uh, you know, we were more getting into the 16-bit land and away from yeah. some of the limitations of the eight-bitters. How did it? How was it sold to you the the deal with the uh, Rainbow? Because obviously it might it must have been difficult going from you know publishing with uh, real time and then using a different publisher. Yeah, um, I don't remember too well. It just all seemed to make sense. It was um, we were having problems with some of the distributors. Some of them were going out of business, owing us money. Um, the magazines you talked to them about reviews and it was like well how much advertising are you doing yeah <laughs> and you know you would talk to some of the big retail outlets about them stocking the game and they're like well we make a lot of our decisions about which games we're stocking for christmas in june and right. you're talking to us and you haven't been taking us out for you know uh, for meals and things like that so no you're not going to be on the shelves um so we kind of realized that you know three pretty naive engineers in leeds we're yeah. really going to struggle and even though we'd have a smaller cut of the pie maybe it'd be a bigger pie and um we did very well from star glider we did very well from star glider it, it, there was uh, there was big numbers um it was a joy to do um in many ways we actually finished the 8-bit versions before jess sam finished the st version <laughs> <laughs> so we did loads of things that were in the spec and they went Oh, uh, actually, you're going to have to take it out because Jess hasn't been able to get around to that yet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, uh, so, yeah, I, th I think I don't think we self-published anything after that. Um, 
yeah. you know, it was it was always transition. We never had this great big plan year by year of you know this is what we're going to do. We were making it because we go went along and leaping at opportunities really. And yeah, I think in retrospect we probably changed as the industry changed. And yeah. I think part of the reason I got out of gaming is it ceased being a kind of engineering activity and became a kind of studio activity and you're going to need artists you're going to need musicians and you're going to need producers and all of this kind of thing and yeah me as part of a team of 30 to 40 people working on a game it was starting to feel like that you know a real job working for the people that we've been trying to avoid all along really. uh, yeah i know what you mean <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, Carrier Command obviously is one of the, um, you know, uh, highly regarded games ever. I, I think it's one of my favourites, certainly, you know. Um, yeah. How did you get the idea for that? Um, again, it was a little bit of a journey. Uh, Rainbird said, right, um, uh, we want to work with you again. We want mm. it to be something original. And we were like, hmm, we remember how hard that is. Uh, and then <laughs> we've got this games designer who's got some ideas. And... He had some good ideas, but he was also quite mad. Um, and uh, Carrier Command was called SCS for ages, and there's still references to it in the source code, which was Submarine Combat Simulation. And the whole idea was it's going to be a submarine game, uh, battling monsters, uh, avoiding volcanoes or vulcanoes, as the game's designer would always call them for reasons we don't understand. Anyway, Rainbow went, right, we've totally followed that with him. He was completely insane. We still want to do something with you. Use whatever ideas you can from that. You can't have any submarines. Uh, we kept the volcanoes. Um, and I think they, Rainbow sent us one piece of paper of an outline, which was yeah. something to do with aircraft carriers attacking archipelagos of islands. And I've still got, I think I've still got a scan of that piece of paper. And we sent something back saying, we've been thinking about it. Here's how we'd like to flesh it out. Mm. And that fleshing out is basically the guts of carrier command. It's a, taking over islands, you and a similarly equipped carrier, uh, maintaining supply lines, mm. um, spinning loads of plates at once, uh, a great big sandbox where you've got, you know, an open world and loads of toys. But absolutely no instructions on how to use them. You're there, you know, the scenario is you've just been thrown in at the deep end, you've got this amazingly complicated thing, you work it out mate, you know, I'm sure you'll make it work, <laughs> or you'll get shot to pieces, it's one or the other, you know. Um, and yeah, I, you know, I've still, at Carrier Command uh, nearly killed us, uh, nearly drove us insane and nearly bankrupted us, um, but I've still got a soft spot for it in a big way, it was... Yeah. It was one of these things where everything came together. It came together late. Um, some of the first releases, it came together buggy. 90% um, of the way through, we got no idea how we were going to do the remaining 10%. We were, we were like, we just, <laughs> we've, we've got, we've got a lot of um, combat with the enemy carrier to come up with, and we've got all of this to come up with, and you know, how do you do this? But uh, you know. We got there, and I don't think there was the single perfect version. Um, PC and Mac, we got the enemy carrier tactics right, which they weren't really that good on the ST and Amiga. PC had the time warp. Unfortunately, PC had got appalling sound. Mm. Uh, there is now a new version out on Steam with new sound effects um, done by uh, uh, David Galetti in Australia. And uh, another guy who's actually in the Canary Islands that I worked with on fixing some of the bugs in there and guiding him through the source code. Um, uh, you know, and, and it, I was very excited when people wanted to do modern remakes, but none mm. of the modern remakes seem to work anything like as well as the original, which is kind of a shame. Really. Yeah. yeah. Some of the best remakes of Carrier Command are the totally uncredited ones where people have gone, well, we were totally inspired by Carrier Command, so we did this game. And we obviously didn't rip it off totally, but uh, <laughs> Carrier Command opened our eyes to a, you know, the, um, you know, uh, real time action game strategy mix, and we went, oh wow, you know, yeah. yes, this is this is this has given us some ideas, which, which is great. It's what it's all about. Yeah, yeah. 
you know, we took some, we took some IT ideas from uh, Atari originally, so, <laughs> so ha, pass it on down the line, really. So the open world part of um, uh, Carry Command, was any of that influ influenced by Elite at all? I don't think so. Um, I don't. Th I, I think it was more influenced by um, uh, some of the kind of fantasy role playing, you know, Dungeons yeah. and Dragons and things like that, and um, uh, you know, board gaming and things. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. I, I, I've, got, I've got absolutely no, um, you know, memory of us taking any ideas from Elite for that that side of things. Elite was a little bit more. Um, you know, the generational world things that people do now where you've got 18 billion worlds to explore. They may all look a little bit similar, but, you know. <laughs> yeah, they're all pretty much the same world, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, but I mean, we were doing that in Carrier Command. The islands, you know, we gave them the names, we specified sizes. Yeah. Uh, the sizes gave the mix of things on the island that was randomly generated, so mm. uh, maybe there's nothing new under the sun. Um, yeah. But Carry Command was interesting because we almost had to do everything twice. Um, when you weren't anywhere near an island, all the battles on the island were going on in a fantasy role-playing, rolling the 20-sided dice kind of way for what unit had got to strike and what unit. It's all very fast. And then when you're at an island, we had to unpack all of that state information of an island's strength in various ways from the yeah. dice rolling yeah. to an actual 3D world and carry on the battle in hopefully the same vein. And then when you left the, left the island, we had to go, well, what's remaining in the 3D world? How do we get all this back to a number of attributes to stick in some simple arrays to carry on doing it in a kind of stochastic way, rolling those dice? Yeah. Um, oh, interesting. So you didn't cheat then? It was all proper battles and everything, you know, from the enemy carrier point of view? Um, yeah, uh, the, no, everything in the background, it, we were just comparing the strengths of various units, um, mm. a little bit of a random of, you know, if the enemy carrier's got this many of these at this island tackling these, you know, what do you think is going to be the outcome, roughly, and let's roll the dice and play it either way. And um, the supply lines in the background uh, were all run um, very realistically. Um, the enemy carrier used its knowledge of distances between things um, where the supply lines were to yeah. evaluate what to attack next. So there was quite a lot of logic going on in the background. Yeah. Um, uh, none of this logic could be run at once because it would have slowed that frame down. So we have got everything in great big, um, uh, I don't know whether to call them matrices or graphs. There were graphs from computer science graph theory. Um, but runners matrices and we'd, we'd iteratively churn the data through them propagating kind of information about what's connected to what right um, i actually looked through a lot of that source code in x86 assembler when i was do doing some of this work on the thing a couple of years ago i can't make out what's going on <laughs> <laughs> is, there, is there anything you'd have changed on carry command in retrospect uh we should have had the time warp functioning to start with um, but again, that was difficult to add, um, kind of in retrospect, and it was easier on the PC because we knew we'd be running at different frame rates. Yeah. So the rate everything moved at scaled with the frame rate. So yeah. all we did when we did the time warp is we said the frame rate's massive, but we're not going to generate any 3D. So everything's going to, you know, mm. leap, leap around like crazy, like you know the. H.G. Wells' time machine when everybody's doubting around. Um, <laughs> so we'd do that while you held the time warp button down and we'd run everything as full pelt. Uh, yeah, we should have thought about time warp in ST and Amiga. Um, uh, we should have thought a little bit more about how the battles with the enemy carrier were going to work. That was always the kind of uh, the elephant in the room is there's this big bit we're going to have to do at some point and it's rather important to the whole <laughs> game and we don't know how to do it. Let's just carry on coding, it'll be fine. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I think I think I was happy with the ST and Amiga, other than the lack of time warp. Um, I was happy with the PC, other than lack of decent audio, and we backported all of the good stuff from the PC to the Mac code base. Right. So the Mac really had the best of quite a lot of worlds, but we were doing it before the Color Macs came along. Yeah. So 
ever had a colour version. So none of them were perfect. <laughs> I always had this idea that I was going to take the uh, better kind of tactics and strategy and the time warp from the Mac code base back into the Amiga code mm. base to do the one perfect one. But, you know, it, there was months of work there and we've got more work coming along and yeah yeah uh mortgages to pay and yeah i think what impressed me the most about it was the uh it's the first time i really saw some really nice ui you know where you could just drag and drop things yeah i mean that was amazing um did you copy that i mean i know it's sort of um it's, it's sort of basic now isn't it but at the time did you see anywhere else did you get your ideas from anywhere else at the time I can't think where all of that came from. Um, all of that was my side of things. And mm. the whole thing of having those two sets of buttons down the side to, for the kind of the higher level thing and the other one, um, you know, that came from me, me as well. And even the shading of the buttons, I did this function called Chocky Box. <laughs> draw, draw something that was like a piece of chocolate, you know, with shading on the sides. Yeah. You know, I, I came up with all of that. I don't know, I don't know where that came from. Um, I mean, it was before Windows came along and before we met the Mac. Yeah. Uh, I don't. I don't really know, to be honest. It just. It must have felt right. I don't know. Yeah, uh, it was just really intuitive and just little things like um, getting a manta out of the bay. You could see it in a little window in real time just pop up. Yeah. Sort of stuff like that. Yeah, we 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 had fun. Um, you know, we had time for some of the bells and whistles, particularly on the PC version, because. Yeah. We've got money coming in from the ST and the Amiga, and we've got a bit of breathing room. You know, we didn't have um, um, Rainbird doing what I call the circle of whips, where you're surrounded by people with whips, and the way to get you to work faster is for the amount of whip really hard. <laughs> 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 uh, it's an analogy I've used a lot in business since uh, people go, oh, how can we get more work out of, you know, Joe? I say, <laughs> well, you know, I can chat to him about how we can take some of the pressure off and, uh, you know, which parts are worrying him and things. Like, no, no, we need to put pressure on him. And I go, let me introduce you to the concept of the circle of whips and imagine how well you'd work. <laughs> in that situation um yeah yeah i don't know it, it, it is interesting you've asked that question about carry command i've never really thought about it uh, carry command's an interesting one because it's hard to think of anything really that inspired us it must have been just something and everything but we decided to just yeah. set off in a new direction really mm. okay. what about star fox how did all that come about um Somebody came along and offered us money to do it.
it, it didn't sound difficult. Um, and um, uh, at the end of the day, I don't have a particularly soft spot for the game. Um, uh, you know, we did it roughly to schedule. Um, the money was good. Um, I remember having really, really serious memory problems. We were doing everything we could uh, to save every last bite. We ran out of money, uh, ran out of money, ran out of memory, mm -hmm. probably about 80% of the way through the game with yeah. huge amounts left to do. So it was just scrimping and saving. And um, I've got a memory that we were cheating regards the distance between some of the planets. Right. One, of the, one of the testers went, that's not right. It's like, that's not right because we don't have a square root function. <laughs> and I went, oh, you need to get those distances right. You know, the raise bug reports. So I thought, oh, no. Ah, you know, I've been fighting at tail merging and combining and looking for any unused anything for ages. I, I, Graham was still programming and I was spending my entire day with great big listings on the floor trying to identify things that could be pulled out to be in subroutines. And, and I thought, how can I do a square root? And it doesn't have to be fast. And you can just do repeated subtract, subtraction of odd numbers. I count how many times you do it. And I got it down to 11 bytes of Z80. <laughs> and I found two unused characters in the 8x8 character set that were next to each other. It's like, well, we never use those two punctuation symbols. So, right, that square root function is good in those. In that <laughs> there. And I'm going to make a note that I've now got five bytes left there. You know, <laughs> it was uh, it was ridiculous. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was. Um, yeah, it was. It, it, that was that really was just work for hire. They came along with some yeah. money. They didn't have any other way to get it programmed. Uh, we did it. Uh, I don't think we ever saw any royalties from it, but I don't think we expected to see any. Yeah. Well, you, you left games, and like you said, you went into uh, cross products, which is basically it's the programming aids, and I would guess you'd call yeah. them. Yeah. 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 Um. We were using uh, a product from another guy in the 8-bit days. It was a really nice product. Um, it really accelerated our work all the way through um, uh, Starglider and loads of other projects. Um, along came the 16-bitters, and he said, oh, I'm doing a 16-bit version. Well, no, that's fantastic. We'll use that. Um, but he hadn't changed the product in any fundamental way, he tried to extend it to do 16 mm. bits and it wasn't fast enough and there wasn't a linker and there wasn't enough room for your source code and it was driving us absolutely bonkers and we were actually sharing some offices with Vector Graphics. Mm. Uh, yeah. You know, we, we, we were in competition and they kept pumping us for information on how we did 3D so fast and we were give you know the reply of the sphinx really mm -hmm. uh -huh. well there's only a certain number of t states what you actually have to do is you write the code to use fewer of them yeah. <laughs> 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 that kind of thing. so i mean it was it was healthy competition uh they were probably more professional and got some big contracts like the official star wars ones um but i think i, th I think it was andy craven just said you know, you're in the same place we are with these tools. Are we still going to be in the situation in a year, two years, three years, or do we want to take control of our own destinies? So each company threw some money in a hat. Mm. Uh, I said I would do all the specification, um, uh, subcontract the work, and um, do documentation and support. Um, and so we kicked off with cross products, and I ran that in parallel with doing other projects um in particular abram's battle tank on the genesis uh, mega drive um but we did um you know the snasm system for eight bitters but it merely was coming into its own on the 16 bitters so i was reverse engineering things like the genesis mm. um, and then i went over to actually work on site with saver towards the end of abram's with yeah. A revolting bit of hand -built hardware and you know get me this pc and i'll install all my tools and so the throughput i had on that system and i went how can we get these i said well i'm actually just commercializing it for the genesis mm. so 
uh, you get these by giving me money and I give you something. <laughs> uh, so uh, Sega very rapidly became our largest customer. Um, I was, I will freely admit, getting burnt out with games and real time I'd overcommitted and we had a backlog of work yeah. to do. And um, yeah, we just we just hit a brick wall. We just I, I ran out of me. I couldn't I couldn't do it any longer. And cross products was taking off, so it was uh, we shut real time down in not too messy a way. The only people who lost out big time were Mirasoft, and you know I don't I don't feel too sad about that. <laughs> Poor pensioners maybe, but not too much about Mirasoft. Nobody else really lost out. Um, uh, I'm going to close the company down without any debts and I carried on with cross products and then very shortly afterwards it was surreal actually um, Electronic Arts said oh, do you want to come along and see us you know, down south somewhere we want to talk about a strategic relationship so we went down to see them and walked in and they went hmm the strategic relationship is actually we'd like to buy your company we were like, Okay. <laughs> I said, um, but we need a business plan to show it's going to be profitable for us. We're like, okay. Went, so could you write that business plan for us? <laughs> We're like, well, well, it's not impossible, but um, is that really how things work? And they went, yeah, but, but I, th I think our guys out in the US can explain it better. Why don't you go out and speak to them? So we went out to visit um, Electronic Arts in California. And we said, well, we'll go and see them in the morning. And um, we'd also had a call from Joe Miller uh, from Sega saying, could you pop in in the afternoon? We'd like to talk about a strategic relationship. So we went to CEA in the morning. It was the same thing of, oh, well, you know, we, you'd need to be a profitable division, do a business plan. And we were like, well, that's like hard work. Uh, we'll think about it. So we went to see Sega in the afternoon. And Joe said, it isn't really a strategic relationship. We'd like to buy your company. <laughs> <laughs> so you're running these companies um, for I did, can't remember how long and then pretty much you know within a few days of each other two people want to buy you and uh, Sega just didn't discuss business plan they said we need your product mm. for our future consoles uh, here is how many million we had in mind and we were like oh that sounds fun uh, while EA were like well you know right you know, we need we need this big business plan and you know, cost benefit analysis and cash flow forecasts. So mm. We'll just have the money then. So yeah, so we we sold out to Sega and um, they required me to have the golden hand club cuffs and carry on working for several years. And um, <laughs> I think I don't know whether I actually made the contract, but the more or less said and uh, we we don't want Andy Craven working for us because. Um, there's a bit of an overlap with the other activities we've got here to do with managing it. So yeah, uh, but he was fine with that. He went is that we we started off a few other businesses as part of the kind of whole group. So he went off with the rest of the group, and uh, we split out cross products for me to take over to Sega. So it, it worked well. Um, I enjoyed working for Sega. I did that for seven years. Um, and we were initially bought by Sega of America, and the Japanese didn't quite understand why. But they <laughs> fine, we've given you autonomy, it's your budget, it's not a huge amount in the grand scheme of things. And then the Japanese quickly realised that what we were doing was very good. Um, and I think they then twigged, they were apparently, I, I never realised at the time, they were very impressed with Abrams' battle tank on the Genesis. And uh, a book on the history of Sega America came out a few years ago, and I was interviewed for it. And it wasn't until I read some of that book I realised that that game was one of the things that convinced them that actually some Western programmers were okay. Right. Sega of America perhaps actually did know what they were doing. And then I think they suddenly realised, hang on, that company they bought is the same guy who did this. Mm. Uh, and it was about the time that um, when was that? probably 97 that was happening so we would save for America for two or three years and then it was very much I was told by the way ownership and management of your company is now moving to Japan oh. so 
you've now got a new Japanese boss. Um, uh, so rather than going to America about twice a month, I started going to Japan about twice a month. Right. Um, Nightmare. And um, they said, oh, we're going to keep it as a separate company, but there'll be, you know, and you'll be on the board, obviously, and a director, but there'll be some Japanese people. So I found myself um, being the only non-Japanese director of a Japanese company for five or so years, which was quite yeah. a learning curve. Quite a learning curve, you know, for a scruffy engineer from Leeds who started <laughs> off in a hall of resin, a back-to-back, you know, coding out computer games. You know, suddenly, you know, you, you find you find yourself slowly having this proper job and running a great big team of people and not being a hands-on engineer, and it was a bit of a worry. What was the biggest difference, do you think, between the corporate world of, like, uh, let's say, the West and um, you know, England, uh, USA, and the Japanese culture, kind of corporate culture? I actually found UK and Japan closer together than I did UK and America. I got um, really well with the Japanese guys, and mm. I found their, I don't know whether it's an island mentality or a hardworking mentality or what, uh, or dedication to the company rather than, you know, the Americans seem to be changing jobs, um, you know, three or four times a year, you know, it's, it is yeah. a, a mad whirlwind. So I got on really well with the Japanese guys. Um, um, I put in the work on the language, which uh, they definitely noticed. Um, <laughs> I remember during the, um, it was probably during some of the early, early design stuff on Dreamcast. I, I just remember being in a room with uh, probably 15 senior Japanese people around the table and they put all the junior Japanese people in chairs around the edge of the room in case they needed. Room full of people, and there's somebody talking away in Japanese. And I thought, I don't like the way this is going at all. What I'm picking up here is, I uh, know, I don't think I, I, I'm going to have to interrupt. So I was like, in Japanese, excuse me, excuse me. You know, to, uh, then in English, I said, I don't think that's correct because, and um, somebody said, excuse me, you know, in some. Did you understand? And I said, hi, well, karimashita, which is Japanese for yes, I understood that. And everybody in the room laughed and <laughs> they broke the ice. And I was like, right, back to the point. And that was the point where they went, I actually, I actually heard from somebody, somebody said, uh, yeah, uh, an email went around the entire company warning them that you could speak Japanese, so careful what you say in front of you. <laughs> and when, when they discovered I could read a little bit of it as well, another email went around. <laughs> Uh, but no, I got on okay with the Japanese. It was not always free of friction. Um, uh, you know, there was a lot of stressful times. Um, but, you know, I, I put in the work. Uh, I treated people with respect. Uh, I did, uh, When I went out on an evening, I did not go to any of the kind of Western places or eat in the hotels. I went off and drunk in bars with people who worked on the docks in Shinagawa. So they thought some of my Japanese was a bit colourful at times. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, uh, I could get my point across, let's say. <laughs> Do you miss working in games at all? Uh, uh, do I, do I? There were some real highs. There were some real highs. There was a lot of things to be proud of. Uh, but there was a lot of, uh, you know, grinding work and stress, financial stress and not wanting yeah. to let people down. Um, I'm in touch with a lot of people who carried on in games. And, um, you know, it, it, uh, I mean, you're, you're in some of the same Facebook groups as I am. And it does seem to have... <laughs> <laughs> It does seem to have yeah, caused people quite a lot of mental anguish, and um, uh, you, perhaps not always without the kind of financial rewards it deserves either, really. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, you know, would I have liked to have carried on in gaming? Yes. You know, would I have survived it mentally? I don't think so. I'm happy with the route I took. It was all, none of it was designed. Yeah. It was all a complete accident. Um, after Dreamcast, um, we got very, very lucky with our new home, with Imagination Technologies. Um, and um, I've got some very 
you know, good memories of my time with Imagination, which, you know, I did for longer than the whole cross products and gaming side of things, really. That was 2001 to 2018. Yeah. So that was a long time, that one. And doing a lot of things there, you know, kind of um, making dab radio happen and yeah, in many ways making smartphones happen. You know, it was, yeah. it was, uh, it was exciting times. Um, but, you know, it, it came out of the ashes of Dreamcast and it was a very sad day when we had to announce we're discontinuing Dreamcast. Um, and when we were acquired by Sega of Japan, I was reporting into, uh, you know, the inevitable Japanese middle manager who got some subterranean offices and um, uh, not very much cachet in the organisation. And as we just kept doing the job, mm. and getting it done, and being successful and being seen to be successful, I kept finding myself reporting to people higher up the ladder and ended up directly reporting to the president. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so I was actually having lunch with Hideki Sato in his private office on the top floor of Sega of Japan on the day we had to announce to the press that we were stopping manufacturing the Dreamcast. Uh, um. mm. uh, and then it was obviously with Sega getting out of hardware, they didn't have any need for development tools any longer. Yeah. Uh, they could have just been uh, complete bastards and shut us down. Um, but they said, um, find a new home for your company. Um, Sega would like money because we put money in and we regard what you have as valuable. But the most important thing is to find a good home for as much of your team as possible. Oh, nice. um, at which point you think, well, you know, you occasionally hear bad things about Japanese and how they treat people. But, you know, I was absolutely amazed to get that message uh, very, very clearly from a number of senior people, including the president. Um, so I set off finding a new home for cross products. Oh, cool. Um, uh, and um, we found, uh, and uh, imagination was never, ever, ever on my list at all. Mm. You know, I had a list of 25 companies to visit. So I, basically I packed a bag and toured the world. Um, never, never looked in the UK. <laughs> 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 I think I did. I think I spoke to ST Micro, but they wanted some of the technology, but not much of the team. So that right. discussion didn't go very far. Whereas um, imagination, I'd actually worked because Imagination did the graphics chip for the Dreamcast via NEC. Yeah. I'd worked with a lot of the Imagination people, including a lot of the senior people, and I acted as go-between with Sega with Pace when we were trying to do a combined Dreamcast and set-top box. Right. We actually did a proof of concept of that that worked um, with the Dreamcast able to download games uh, over the a kind of satellite or digital TV channel to a hard disk. Um, so, you know, just imagination kind of knew me and knew what me and my team could do. So, and unbeknownst to me, imagination was moving into processes and programmable devices. So, oh. it was actually a chance dinner, which I was not at, between one of the senior people in Japan um, and uh, Hussein Yasai. Uh, from imagination where um, the guy said, oh, you know, Hussein said, why are you in the UK? It's like, well, we're trying to find a new home for cross products. It's like, why haven't you spoken to me? <laughs> so the next thing I knew, <laughs> uh, this guy, uh, Hagi Arasan, who said, oh, yeah, uh, imagination might want to acquire you. He's like, well, that'd be rather nice. I like those guys. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, and it happened fairly quickly. Cool. Um, the um, the attack on the Twin Towers kind of coincided with us putting the whole contract together and made things difficult. So yeah. uh, I don't know how many people managed to finalise sale of the company in October uh, of that year, but we did. Brilliant. <laughs> mm. Mm. Yeah, but, I mean, it, it, it was a chance thing. And the, I mean, I ended up, uh, Hagiwara san was on the board of Cross Products, but he and I always had a little bit of a difficult relationship. And then he said, 
I've been asked to write a paper for uh, IEE and um, I've written it in Japanese but they want me to translate it but I don't have a good translator. That's one. I don't know Japanese well enough so when, well I'll send it to you in English but just through an auto translator so it's simply this thing. <laughs> what? So I said right I will try and translate into one part of it and you tell me what you think. Is it a good translation? Because I'm really am having trouble understanding it from the auto translator, and I'm going back to the original Japanese and putting it through different ones. What do you think? And he went, "Oh, you've captured what I meant absolutely brilliantly. I'm going to put you down as co-author." So well, I'll finish it then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, but, you know, just one of these complete accident things. So that was why, you know, when I was finding a home for Crossbow, so I don't know whether I asked him if he'd help or he offered to help or whatever. Yeah. But I think it came off the back of doing that uh, paper together, which wasn't a great paper to be honest, but it's all right, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, it did the job. Um, so yeah, we ended up with imagination um, and worked well. Again, you know, not not trouble free. <laughs> <laughs> Hussein, Hussein can out shout the Japanese any day of the week. <laughs> mm. I know you said it's, um, would, would you say that, uh, would it be part of any of your career you would have changed? Uh, any of what, sorry? Any of your career you would have changed? Looking um, back. No, because I've ended up in a good place. I mean, I could say, you know, I can recognise a lot of mistakes I've made and things I could have done better. Yeah. But, you know, uh, somehow, even though it was a mistake, something good seemed to come, come out of it. Um, yeah, I understand. No, you know, not really. Um you know, it's, we started trying to employ people before we really knew what employing people was all about. So that was a mistake. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we didn't know how difficult original games were going to be, so that was a mistake. But yeah, but you know, you can't... Uh, I think the honest answer to your question is no, I've enjoyed it all. It's, you know, it's, um, there's been challenges, there's been a lot of stress and you know, when you're under stress for a long time and can't see an end to it, it can lead to medical problems. So, you know, yeah. I didn't have bad medical problems, but, you know, let's just say we tried all kinds of things to fix them and retiring seems to be a magic point. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, thanks for doing the chat with us, Ian. It's been great, really interesting. You want, sorry? Thanks for doing the chat. It's been really okay. interesting. Yeah, sorry. Right. Well, if there's if if there's anything else you want to know, let me know. I can, uh, you know, I can both from my country on this stuff. I'm doing um, uh, doing Crash Live in a couple of weeks. All oh, right. So, okay. So I'm up there for what's billed as an hour and a half answering questions. So it's like, uh, yeah, uh, Chris who's running it is like, oh, you know, do you have enough stories from the old days to fill an hour and a half? I said, well, probably, but I can just make up some new ones. It'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you know, over multiple decades, you know, you only you only need to remember a few things per year, and you can you can you know, fill many hours with weird anecdotes, particularly about some, <laughs> some of the stuff we got up to in you know Japan with those big gangs of us there for a while and out on a few beers, you know. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, look forward to seeing it. Well, thanks again. Okay, and you take care, mate. Okay, thanks, mate. Right. see ya. Bye. Bye. -bye.